collaboration with Eura Access Asia and Marie Curie Alumni Association Southeast Asia chapter. We are blessed today, as we do have with us today, UNIMAP's uh, Vice Chancellor, Professor Insinio Arbadi Shah, and also speakers from uh, European Commission. Uh, without further delay, I would like to welcome Professor Insinio Arbadi Shah for his uh, welcome notes. Please, Prof. Thank you, Dr. Shoida. Assalamualaikum. Uh, very good afternoon and uh, greeting to all, ladies and gentlemen, our distinguished speakers, Mr. Adrian Will. Uh, International Unit of the EC Department for Education, Youth, Culture and Sports European Commission. Uh, Ms. Ellen Flanagan, European Union Delegation to uh, Malaysia, as well as participants from UNIMAP and other uh, universities. Welcome to today's uh, webinar, uh, Explore Europe Through Erasmus Program. So I am delighted to be here uh, and then it is a uh, a privilege to have uh, both our speakers uh, will be sharing their insight and experience with us and uh, I would like to congratulate to Research Management Center of UNIMAP and the, under the Prof. Uh, Dr. Mustafa uh, for able to organize uh, such event. Uh, UNIMAP is, uh, is a fairly very young university. We are nearly uh, 18 years old. Uh, and uh, more, more than 50% of our uh, academic staff are very young, uh, which is below 45 uh, age. And uh, I always encourage our staff uh, to explore uh, for more opportunities, either locally and also internationally. I think Prof. Mustafa and uh, his team has done a very good job in UNIMAP for securing number of uh, international grants and as well as uh, involved in many international uh, events, especially on the Erasmus. So uh, Erasmus program, I suppose, uh, provides a platform for networking and also provide research opp opportunities uh, in Europe. It is uh, fit with the UNIMAP direction which we want to expand our international research network. And of course, as a young universities, I think our existence at the international level is very much uh, uh, required so that we are able to, uh, uh, to get more international students uh, to come to Malaysia, especially UNIMAP, and also we can have more collaboration works uh, together. So I would like to uh, express my appreciation to the uh, European Commission, especially Mr. Adrian uh, from the International Unit of the EC Department for Education, Youth, Culture and Sports uh, European Commission for making time to share uh, his valuable information on Erasmus. And also very much thanks to uh, Ms. Ellen uh, for this uh, arrangement. Thank you very much. Thank you also uh, to Research Management Center UNIMAP or RMC for hosting this event. And uh, this event is a, a joint collaboration with uh, Eura Access uh, Asia, Asian and Mary Curry Alumni Association Southeast Asia chapter. So I hope uh, this webinar session will be useful uh, to all. And uh, I hope everyone here, uh, there's around uh, 93 participants here. And uh, I hope that uh, you guys will enjoy this, this talk given by these experienced two uh, speakers. And let us uh, ce celebrate the new normal by participating in this webinar and looking forward for more sharing session online in the near future. So with that, thank you very much and I hope to see you soon. Thank you, uh, Professor Insinio Arbadil Shah. We will proceed with our speakers, but before that, let me briefly introduce our speaker. Our first speaker is Ms. Ellen Flanagan. Ms. Flanagan is a political officer with the European Union's delegation to Malaysia. Before working for the European Union, she held a position at Ireland's representation to the European Union. 
She obtained a degree in law and a master's in EU international relation and diplomacy. Whereas our second speaker is Mr. Adrian Will. Mr. Will works for the European Commission in Brussels in the international units of the EC Department for Education, Youth, Culture and Sport. He oversees the Commission's work with Asia on the Erasmus Plus, Plus program, which supports higher education, exchange and cooperation, and on education policy dialogues with various Asian countries. Uh, some information will be running a Q&A session at the end of the webinar session. So if you have any question, just pop them in the next uh, box on the top right hand side of your screen. And you can choose to ask questions at the end of the session as well. And if you miss anything, don't worry, we will be sending around uh, the on-demand recording when it's available. So before, uh, without further ado, let us start. Uh, I think we will start with uh, Ms. Planigan. Okay, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Salamat Tangahari. And thank you very much to the RMC at UNIMAP um, and for having us here today, and also to your Access Asia and MCAA Southeast Asia chapter for co hosting. And a special thanks also to the Vice Chancellor for being present here today. Um, my name is Ellen Flanagan, and I work at the European Union delegation to Malaysia. And I'm very lucky to be joined today by my Brussels-based colleague, Adrian, who has extensive knowledge in this area. Um, we aim to keep this presentation quite short and move to a Q&A session. So please feel free to ask all your questions at the end and we'll do our best to answer. Now, if we can go to the second slide, please. Um, so we were asked to provide an overview of the Erasmus Plus programme and funding opportunities for Malaysian higher education institutions. And the EU and its member states really consider these educational exchanges as a key element of our relationship with Malaysia. And the Vice Chancellor also noted that these exchanges are very important, especially for universities that are, um, that are developing, that are getting up and running on the international stage. Um, so the Erasmus Plus is a worldwide program it began over 30 years ago with intra-European projects that aimed to increase internationalization across European borders. So the majority of funding is European for European projects and exchange. But since 2014, Erasmus Plus has become more inter, um, has acknowledged the need to increase internationalization at the global level. So the current program has a strong international dimension, supporting projects for cooperation or exchange between Europe and the rest of the world. Um, now we'll go on to the next slide, please. Um, Erasmus international projects in the area of higher exchange are based on partnerships between the European organizations and those in other parts of the world. So on the European side, there are 34 program countries, which all have a national agency. Oops. These all include, these include all of the EU member states and six other countries outside of the EU, which also have a national agency and contribute to the program. So these include Iceland, Liechtenstein, Norway, Serbia, North Macedonia, and Turkey. And then we can see in the next slide our partner countries which include countries from all over the world who benefit from the programs, including Malaysia. And then we have in our next slide, opportunities for higher institutions from partner countries. So as you can see here, there are, four, there are multiple options under the Erasmus program, and we're going to focus on four today. The first two, International Credit Mobility and Erasmus Mundus Joint Masters focus on the mobility aspects of the program. And the second two, capacity building for higher education and the Jean Monnet activities, focus more on academic cooperation and teaching. Um, and we'll look at each in turn. So I'll hand over to Adrian now to talk to you about the first option, international credit mobility. Okay, thanks, thanks, Ellen. Um, yes, it's a bit of a long term international credit mobility, um, but it's in fact um, a classic exchange program. Um, this was pioneered in Europe between 
two European universities who would work together and they would send and host uh, their students and, and the students from a partner university. And um, as Ellen said, in 2014, we expanded the, uh, our European Erasmus to make it um, available for universities outside Europe. So um, when we talk about international credit mobility, it will be an agreement between a university somewhere in Europe and um, a Malaysian university, an Indonesian university, um, and they would um, they would give a fee waiver to students from their partner university to come and and study um, uh, in Europe. Now these these mobilities are two way, in fact. So you ha might have a Spanish university sending students to Malaysia. Um, you might have an Indonesian university sending students to uh, Finland. And altogether, um, this uh, action will send nearly 200,000 students and staff between uh, Europe and, and other parts of the world. Um, for, for students, it's generally uh, short-term studies. It, it's, it's usually a semester, uh, but it can be a, a full academic year at bachelor's, master's level, also for doctoral candidates. Um, but it's also open to staff. So your institution's staff can uh, have a short-term uh, visit to Europe, for example, um, either as part of the teaching staff, research staff, or, or administrative staff as well to help set up um, the partnership um, in the beginning. Um, mechanically, if you like, it works big, um, it's led by the European universities. So um, the university in Europe will apply to its national agency um, in France, in Sweden or Portugal to um, set up mobility schemes with universities uh, in different parts of the world. And we have, um, actually we have regional sub programs, if you like, uh, with regional budget. Uh, and Malaysia is part of a, a larger Asian region, which is actually not only Southeast Asia, but also South Asia and, and China all together in, in one region. And that gives uh, you an idea of the number of students and staff um, each year, um, something like four and a half, five thousand students and staff going. And about two thirds of those are coming to Europe um, uh, rather than Europeans coming to, to Asia. So it's, it's, it's slanted a bit towards benefiting the Asian universities and students more than uh, the Europeans. I said Malaysia uh, and, and other countries in Asia are part of this regional window, as we call it. And this gives you an idea of the way your countries are represented in this. Obviously, as you might expect, um, large countries, uh, especially China, is, is a, a major beneficiary of this action. Um, but uh, other countries too, I mean, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, uh, Cambodia, all do um, uh, pretty well because this actually reflects the sorts of agreements that the European universities set up with um, their Asian counterparts. Um, and you can see also in, in all cases, you have um, more Asians going to Europe than, than um, Europeans going to Asia. This is the situation up to now. Um, there'll be another selection of projects in uh, the summer. And this will continue in the new program, which I'm going to talk about a, a little bit later. So credit mobility, it's a classic exchange between two individual um, universities. Um, and we have another mobility scheme, which I think Ellen is going to talk about, which is more um, related to a specific study program. Thanks, Adrian. Um, so the second um, option under the Erasmus Plus that we'll speak about today that contains an element also of mobility is the Erasmus Mundus Joint Masters Programme, another like, nice long title for you, um, which both universities and students can benefit from. And the Erasmus Mundus is a joint master's programme awarding a degree with study in two or more universities in partnership in different countries. 
and the EU funds um, a scholarship which is open to everybody worldwide and students do not need to be registered with a partner university. So we'll look at the options for universities under this program and for students. So firstly for universities, there are 350 joint master degree courses to be selected between 2014 and 2020. And the program is expected to have funded about 30,000 students and staff over the seven year period, which is quite, a, quite an amount. Each um, selected program receives EU funding, which covers around 15 to 20 scholarships for the best students selected over four annual intakes. And there are 123 of these um, mas joint master's degrees that will select students in 2020. And then an application to run a program needs to be submitted by a European university on behalf of the partnership. And Erasmus Mundus can involve partner universities from partner countries, but it isn't, it's not essential. And universities from partner countries can also be associate partners in a consortium. So as such, they do not, they don't award the, they don't co-award the degree, but they can provide placements, research opportunities, or field work or teaching. So we're seeing the international exchange here again. And an associate status may be a more feasible step for universities, particularly from maybe developing countries. And in 2020, there will be 47 new joint Erasmus Mundus joint master's degrees. And from the student perspective, students can apply annually. The latest application round was open from October 2019 and closed in January 2020 for scholarships for the program starting, well, meant to be starting in September, October 2020. And students can apply directly to the course, which can be found on the Erasmus Plus website. Um, but just to be aware that in 2020, the intake is likely to be delayed or maybe postponed until 2021 or partially replaced by online learning. Um, so the decision of which option to adopt will be with the individual consortia. So we'll have to see, see where that goes. And now onto the next slide, please. Um, so to give one example of a relevant um, project in the region, it's the recently launched Erasmus Mundus Master's Programme on Tropical Biodiversity and Ecosystems, which will give um, biology students the possibility to conduct a portion of their studies in the tropics. So in Malaysia, they can go to the mangrove forests or other di biodiverse regions before carrying out the theoretical research in the EU. And this is a perfect example of the cooperation on offer between universities and regions specializing in different areas of academia. And it provides students with the opportunity to gain insight into the practical and theoretical elements of their studies. So um, under this program, they would have two full semesters abroad um, and one of which is located in the tropics for field um, coursework. Um, and under this program, they have an option of either Guadeloupe, Cameroon, Madagascar, Malaysia, um, which I think is the University of Malaysia Terengganu, and Hong Kong. So this program aims to build worldwide expertise in tropical rainforests, woodlands, and coastal ecosystems. And um, as we know, those topics are getting more and more important. So, so it's a pretty good example. And now I'm going to hand back over to Adrian to speak to you about capacity building for higher education. Yep, thanks, thanks, Ellen. So um, the, the joint master degree, um, what, what I would suggest actually is that perhaps um, to see whether your universities would be ready uh, to take part in, in a new uh, joint master degree, you might sort of investigate among your different faculties which faculties are already cooperating with um, other universities you know on developing uh, joint teaching developing new programs because that sort of if you like individual connection between two professors two lecturers two researchers in different universities 
can often be the sort of seed from which um, a whole joint program grows. Um, so rather than seeing it as something abstract, I think you need to, to look at it. Um, well, okay, our um, engineering faculty already cooperates with, with universities in other parts of the world, in Europe. Let's see whether that could be the basis for um, a, a joint program under Erasmus Mundus. Um, another form of university cooperation, um, and I think probably um, one of the most interesting for, for you, um, is what we call capacity building for higher education, um, which are actual cooperation projects between um, a, a partnership of universities. So it's a partnership made up of Europeans on the one side and universities from um, Asia on the other side. Uh, when I say universities from Asia, it's also open to um, other parts of the world like Latin America, um, Africa, um, uh, and Central Asia, and our neighborhood regions, for example. Um, so the, these projects um, can be aimed at two main beneficiaries. Uh, what we call joint projects, which make up the majority of projects, really aim at developing a group of universities. Um, and when I say develop, I mean uh, developing new teaching uh, and, and or teaching material, new teaching techniques, um, or it could um, also work at uh, improving staff training, uh, staff knowledge. Um, some projects also focus on the actual administration of the university. So what does a university need to work on to be better placed and, and more prepared for internationalization? And this might mean, for example, um, the way it uh, runs its international office, um, the way it, it is able to, um, to uh, accredit its, uh, its programs. So joint projects are focused more on the benefits for universities and structural projects do that plus they look at um, how they can contribute towards policy reform so um, it might be a project that looks at for example um, quality assurance in universities but those projects will also involve um, probably a ministry of education or um, the authority dealing with quality assurance to um, make sure that those that new thinking is developed at a policy level as well as within the different universities. Um, so two, two types of, of projects. Um, on the Asian side as well, you can have two um, setups, if you like. Uh, the, the, the Asian um, partners can all be from one country. So you could have a, a purely Malaysian project on, on the Asian side or purely Indonesian, or you could have a regional one, which um, brings together uh, different uh, universities from different countries working together on the same theme, the same topic, the same um, policy area. Um, they are usually three years, these projects, um, and uh, they, at the moment, they, they, have, they can have a budget of up to um, about 900,000 or, or 1 million euros uh, for the activities that they're going to carry out. Um, that all sounds rather abstract. Um, sorry, I, I, one, one thing about the budget I was going to say. What is very interesting for you is that we have this global budget for uh, the program. And you'll see that um, for Asia, we have given it uh, particular priority. So almost a third of, of the, the budget for these projects actually goes to, to Asia. So um, as Malaysian, Indonesian uh, regional projects, you have um, perhaps a better chance than if you come from uh, um, other parts of the world, simply because the EU's policy towards Asia, um, which funds these uh, projects, attaches great importance to, to higher education uh, cooperation. Um, here's a little bit also about um, performance of uh, the different countries. Um, and you'll see there in, in particular that um, 
that uh, Southeast Asian countries are also performing very well. Um, uh, Malaysia, uh, Vietnam especially, Thailand, Cambodia, uh, Indonesia, all, all these countries are, are doing very well. Um, what's also interesting and um, a little bit of a contrast from the two um, parts of the program we've talked about so far is that the Malaysian, uh, the non-European um, partners in a project can be the instigator, the coordinator of, of a project. So um, that's why you see in this in this chart that some or you, you see the little orange part of the bars there represents um, the fact that we have among those um, 70 odd uh, projects um, with Malaysian partners, some of those are actually coordinated by the Malaysian uh, partner. So um, this is um, a reflection of the fact that a capacity building project really has to be clearly relevant uh, to that country's development, if you like. Um, think of it as a, as a it, it's a bit of a mix. It's, it's an education project, but it's also in a sense, um, a cooperation project, a development cooperation project. So you should be focusing on what the benefits are to your university, to your education system, but also to your country. Um, and and that, that a great deal of importance is, is, is attached if it's helping to train graduates in a particular priority area, or if it's um, developing techniques, for example, to tackle uh, a particular challenge that might be environmental or um, social. Um, these have to, um, to address both the education aspect and the development aspect. Um, it's a bit difficult to, to explain these things in, in great detail without getting, without looking at examples. Um, so I, I've just picked two um, examples to show very briefly the sort of range of activities that these projects can carry out and, and the sort of shape that they, they can have. Um, so I've got two types of projects. Um, the first, called Tuning Asia Southeast, um, is a joint project. So this is a project that is focused on the benefits to the individual um, universities involved. And, and this geographically has a very wide spread. You have partners from uh, seven different countries in Southeast Asia and quite a number of, of different partners um, involved. Um, this project um, is actually uh, led from Spain. It, it's a, a, a partner in Bilbao in, in Spain that leads the project, but it has, um, for example, three uh, Malaysian universities, Science Malaysia, University of Malaya, and University Technology Malaysia, um, and uh, about three from uh, Indonesia, four from the Philippines, for example. And together, um, those, uh, th this project looks at the ways of um, developing better, more student-centered education um, within, those, um, within those individual uh, universities. Um, it's focusing on, on different areas, civil engineering, medicine, uh, teacher training, teacher education. Um, and it's, a, it's actually transferring quite a, a pioneered project from Europe that looks at the way to improve teaching by looking at the competences that uh, it, uh, it um, promotes within the students and, and the graduates coming out of the program. Then um, the other project is different in nature. It's a national project, as you can see, only Malaysian partners. Um, it's also led by um, a Malaysian uh, university, University Putra Malaysia. Um, and this um, project looks at the way that universities themselves can be um, contributing to sustainability and energy efficiency. So not necessarily in, in, in what they are teaching, but in the way they actually um, manage their 
institutions and in that way instill this sense of um, sustainable behavior and energy efficiency in, in their graduates as well. Um, so you have a, a, a partnership of Malaysian universities um, working on that alongside universities from Spain, Italy and, um, and Austria. What's also different about this project is that it's a structural project. So um, it involves the um, ministry to um, try and set up a national framework for sustainability in the education sector. Um, so capacity building projects, um, they are larger projects. They, um, uh, they need to do two things. They need to focus on, on the benefits for education and the benefits for, for the country as a whole. So they have to tackle um, uh, challenges that, that you, uh, you as a country are addressing. Um, and um, uh, I, I would recommend that you look at some of the examples of the projects. Um, I'll come to that a little bit later. I should have said that before, but um, one major principle for Erasmus Plus projects is that we make the results of all projects um, widely available. So um, this can help you, this can be an inspiration for you to submit your own project, but it, it also simply makes the results of projects available to a wider audience. So if you like, everyone can benefit from the work done by, by these projects. So I'd recommend that you have a look at at what these projects are doing because um, uh, we like to see uh, a wider range of people benefiting from, from the projects in, in the long term. The next, oh, oh sorry, I haven't clicked this up. The next um, area of work is the Jean Monnet, a very different area of activities, which uh, I think Ellen is going to talk about. Okay, thanks, Adrian. Um, so we've already covered a few activities now and we'll cover this one and then we can go on to some questions and answers because we've already um, gone through quite a lot of material. So the Jeanne Monet activities, um, they provide grants to universities and professors to teach and um, spread knowledge about studies of European integration. And they're open to universities or institutions worldwide. And despite their apparent focus on European elements or European focus, there are many institutes from institutions from outside of um, Europe involved. So many are looking at European integration in light of their own regional integration studies in their own part of the world. So particularly relevant to maybe studies involving ASEAN regional integration um, in this part of the world. Um, and we'll go on to the next slide, please. Thanks. Yes, sorry about that. I seem to. That's fine. Uh, there we go. That's it. Sorry. Perfect. Thanks. And the Jean Monnet projects are their individual projects. As a partner country university, um, you do not need a European partner to to establish one to do one of these projects. And this program is aimed to support the development of teaching materials, professorships, or chairs to teach European studies, or centers of excellence um, within universities that spread information about European integration to a wider audience. And the projects can also aim to provide a range of activities to explain European integration, or to develop networks to do this. Um, and one example that is here in Malaysia is, uh, the, Europe, is the Asia Europe Institute at uh, University of Malaya, which became an Erasmus Plus Jean Monnet Centre for Excellence in 2017. And we'll have that for three years, so until this year. And the Asia Europe Institute is doing really great work enhancing the fields of European or EU and um, comparative regionalism studies in Malaysia um, through this Jean Monnet Centre of Excellence. So that's just one example. Um, and now I think I'll turn back to Adrian and he can give you a short recap of what we've gone through so far and then maybe we can answer some of your questions. 
yeah, thank, thanks, Ellen. Here's, I mean, here's a quick um, recap of what we said, um, albeit very quickly. We, we plowed through a lot of information there. Um, what we said about um, applying, um, and I noticed um, there was a, a question in the chat uh, about credit mobility. Um, how do we apply? Um, there, the um, the application needs to come from Europe. It needs to come from a, a program country. Same for the Erasmus Mundus uh, joint master degrees. Um, to be honest, we don't have much in the way of a um, partner search or a matchmaking facility. Um, so what I, I propose is, like I said before, I think you need to do a little bit of an audit within your own institutions. Um, if you're at the um, the uh, rectorate or, or, or chancellor level within your university, perhaps look through, uh, you know, talk to the deans, uh, look through what the different faculties are doing in way of um, international cooperation, because often I think that can be the entry point, um, some form of uh, maybe a memorandum, memorandum of understanding, or maybe something much more informal um, at faculty level that that's going on between you and and other countries. Um, I think um, European universities are always looking for partners in, in Asian countries uh, for their credit mobility projects. And I think you know, if, if you know what's required um, to take part, um, then you know, I, I think you can, uh, you can present yourself as a, as a candidate that's ready to, to, to step into uh, an agreement uh, like this. Um, capacity building uh, projects, uh, the application can come from um, Asia. Same for, for Jean Monnet. So, um, and, and for Jean Monnet, in, in essence, it's, it's much simpler because it's, there is no partnership involved. You just need um, uh, to, to design your own project and, and submit it. Um, I'd also uh, like to say a little bit, I mean, you'll have noticed that uh, in the first slide, we talk about a project, uh, a program rather, that um, runs until 2020. Um, it will be, um, we'll have a re-edition, if you like, of Erasmus after uh, the end of this year. Um, and the idea is that we're not going to have much in the way of change. We, we actually reckon that it works quite well. Um, and so um, it will uh, be very similar to the current program, um, but it will probably, there's a big, uh, I, I'd stress probably, have um, more budget than uh, the previous program and it will be more international in nature. So um, some of the opportunities that have only been available to uh, Europeans up to now will become available to um, to non-Europeans. So some of the work, for example, on vocational education and training uh, may also become uh, open to um, uh, Malaysian partners. Um, we're waiting a little bit um, because we need to decide as, as, as the European Union, we need to decide on what is the budget after 2021. And that, uh, to be honest, is causing a few um, problems uh, reaching agreement between uh, the the different European countries it's a it's a big decision to take um, and um, the uh, corona pandemic has not helped um, that decision making process so everything is a little bit delayed and um, we can assure you that there will be a new program um, in 2021 but it might not be starting up at the beginning of the year um, but you can be ready um, to um, uh, for the opportunities that do become available. Here's, uh, here are some links to some more information. And what I said before um, is the uh, what's also very useful is for you to look at what current projects are doing. Um, and this um, you can uh, consult in what we call the project results platform. 
So this is uh, important for the EU to, to show what's, what it's spending money on. But it's also important for the sector um, to be able to benefit from what other projects have done. So um, you can go onto this uh, project results platform, you will see existing projects, um, you can tailor a search. Um, I, I think you'll get this presentation and behind that link CBHE in Malaysia, um, you will see that that is actually a, um, a search within the platform to, to, to show all the projects in with Malaysian partners working on capacity building. So you can go in and have a look and those um, project entries will also, um, they are obliged to publish results of the project. So you can see uh, what they have done and hopefully you can also benefit whether it's inspiration or actually um, uh, new courses. Um, I'm gonna stop there so that we can maybe go to, um, questions. Yes, I'm uh, also having a look through the, the chat as I, as I speak, but um, I'll, I'll hand back to um, Shida. That's Mr. Edwin. So, yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, before that, before we proceed to Q&A session, I would like to convey the appreciation from our uh, Vice Chancellor because he had, uh, he has another engagement. So he has to, he had to leave early. So uh, thank you. Uh, from uh, the Vice Chancellor and also reminder uh, to other participants who are yet registered, please, uh, uh, please register yourself so that you get the e-certificate from us by filling up the Google form. You can have the address in the chat, uh, chat uh, uh, se section. So, and yeah, now we would like to open for Q&A session. For those no. who would like to ask, can you please uh, introduce yourself and state your affiliation or your institution and those who have posted the question on the chat uh, box, I will read it for you uh, after the question being uh, asked by someone. So we have time. We still have like, about 10 minutes. Is it okay? Hello. Uh, Hi. Hello. Yes, okay, I'm, uh, I'm Dr. Muhammad Yusuf from International Islamic University from Kuantan Campus. I would like to ask about any um, Rasmus project with IIUM before this or currently? So a project with, um, sorry, I didn't quite catch that. A project with IUM, you mean involving? Yeah, for example, in terms of um, staff exchange program or staff attachment research uh, attachment, because I'm looking for more on staff and academics enhancement uh, for, uh, for the newly, uh, you know, for current uh, PhD holders who just joined the university within the five years. So maybe any, you mentioned just now there's one program, but I wonder whether IIUM has that kind of program. IIUM means the International Islamic University in Malaysia. Um, I, I think I, I would propose that um, you the, the project results platform that I, I mentioned before, I think is, is the place to, to look. Um, you, can, you can carry out a search on, on the basis of a topic. Um, if, you know, if your focus is on um, you know, doctoral candidates and, and, and how they get involved, or you can look for the name of the institution as well. What about the John Monet program, something like that you mentioned just now? Sorry, but I, the, the joint? Uh, I think the Sean Monet, something you mentioned, the program. And ah, the Jean, um, the, yeah, the, the Jean Monet program is, um, you have to have um, a specialization in uh, teaching European studies. So it's, it's, um, it's actually quite a, a niche area. And when we say European studies, uh, it's, uh, it, it can look at the the impact of European Union policies in in a number of areas. So you you might have um, 
it might not necessarily be a school of political studies or um, uh, economic studies. It, it might be, um, uh, you might have a, an agricultural uh, faculty, for example, that is looking at um, the uh, veterinary standards that are adopted by Europe so that um, farming in, in your country can meet uh, European standards. So it, it can be a, a wide range of, of different um, subject areas, but they have to be focused on um, showing how European Union policies develop and, and impact um, in your country. Thank you. Adrian, can I read the question from the chat uh, chat box? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think some of it uh, you already answered. For example, a uh, question from uh, Azrami Abdullah Al Hadi. Any Malaysian university has become partner for the joint master degree program in EU universities? Yes. Um, the, not many. Um, the, to become a full partner, you have to design the program, you have to um, award the degree. Um, and actually, this Tropimundo project that Ellen described um, uh, is one of the few projects where we have a full partner from Malaysia. However, there's, if you like, a, a secondary role that um, universities can play, and it's called associate partner. And that means that you may, um, for example, uh, you may offer uh, teachers for the program, you may uh, offer field visits to um, students, you may promote the program uh, at, at large in your country um, without actually being involved in awarding the degree. So that, that can be a first step, if you like, to, to full partnership uh, within the project. All right, uh, I think that that's answered pretty much uh, that question. So second question is about credit mobility. Um, where to get more information on credit mobility and how to apply? Do we need to find, do we need to have or find collaboration prior to apply or the host university about, uh, advertise? Um, yes, it was, I, I sort of half answered this question or I said yeah. half of the question before. Um, I think what I'd say is, is if you, you're asking if you need to have collaboration um, in in advance. Um, no, um, in in fact, it it's it's good if you can show the the strength of your partnership. That is one good thing. But on the other hand, and maybe this is a bit contradictory, uh, we want credit mobility to to reach out, and we want it to form new partnerships. In fact, so we don't necessarily want it to be a substitute you, you know as a substitution funding for something that you would do anyway we're very interested in in the the role that credit mobility can play in setting up new relationships between europe and and the rest of the world so um i think you you just need to show that you are well suited to work together um you you don't necessarily need to to point to a, a, a long history of, of collaboration okay so uh, i think that's that's answer uh, the question and the question i think you have the information so the, uh, it asks um, may i know where can we get more information on the shared learnings of previous successful project for example, Malaysia Sustainable University Campus Network. Could you lead us to the link, please? So I think this is uh, available in, in your slide. Correct me if I'm yeah. wrong. Yes, that, that's available in, in the slide. Yes. One, one word about the, the results of the projects, just so, th so that you know this. Um, each project is obliged to publish um, results on, on what it has done, what it has achieved. Um, a slight problem about this is that that obligation only starts once the project has finished. And as I said, a lot of these projects are three year projects. Um, the first project started in 2015, 2016. So a lot of the more recent projects won't yet have reached the stage where they're publishing results. So we only actually 
really have results from the first two or three generations of projects. So it's just to, for your expectations that not every project that we have in our list um, is at the point where it's published results so far. So, uh, so the the CBHE in Malaysia, I think this is a fairly new project, or so. No, so CB, no, that that link, um, in fact, is is a search. Yeah. So if so, by yeah. clicking on that link, that will um, it it will take you to a list of all the projects with Malaysian oh. partners. So there, I think there are thirty three projects. Right. Um, it's just to show you that that is the way that you can use the project results platform. You, you can make a search on the basis of country, um, type of project, uh, you can use keywords as well. All right. Okay, I think one last question. Uh, do, we need, uh, do we need to conduct need analysis before we could submit the proposal for CBHE? How can we know the PIC number of, uh, of the other universities? Okay, this is um, uh, a good question. It's, it's, it's going into a little bit more technical detail. Mm -hmm. on, on the first part of the, the, the question, that's a very important point to raise. It's, it's what I sort of alluded to before, that um, uh, when you put in a project proposal, it has to be very clear because it, it is assessed by experts. We, we, um, when it comes to, to Brussels, uh, we have a large team of, of academic experts and they look at um, different aspects of the proposal. One very important aspect of the proposal is its relevance. So you, you, have, to, you have to answer a number of um, award criteria, as we call them, in the selection. And one of those is to show how relevant the project is. So um, you have to show the contribution it'll make to a particular sector or a particular policy challenge, um, as well as the, the benefits for, for the education sector. Um, so that means that probably, yes, you will need to have some sort of needs analysis to back up that uh, relevance section. Um, it'll need to be clear why this project is needed. And, and so, because remember, um, you're in competition with, with a number of, of other projects. At the moment, we're we're selecting probably 150 projects from about 900 applications. So it's not, it's not completely daunting, that success rate, but um, you, you're competing uh, and, and we probably only select about one in, in six of, of the proposals. So a strong proposal is strong because it, it, it's clear why it's needed. And the second one about the pick number, um, pick number is is um, it's actually a system we have in in the the EU. Uh, I think I don't actually know what it stands for. I think it, it's personal identification code or something. Um, but you your university needs one of these in order to put in an application, and there is um, a um, it's called the participant portal. If you if you Google EU participant portal, you, you will find it quite easily. And that is um, a sort of database of all the organizations which have registered to take part in EU projects. Um, and they are listed by, uh, well, it includes a reference to their PIC code. So um, the participant portal is the place to, to find um, uh, universities w with that profile and that could in fact be a way of of looking for for partners uh, yeah we have two more questions but I do not know whether do we have time because you, you have another engagement you have another meeting to go after this can you I, I well I've got about yeah I've got about two or three minutes okay can I just uh, quickly read uh, one uh, two questions or the first one uh, is there any opportunity for students who want to establish educational website, such a collaborating social researcher in any specific place, share their ideas and cooperate each, each other for conducting social research? And another question, um, are UK universities still be part of hosting the program or no longer after Brexit? Um, on the second one, second rather painful question, um, uh, the 
we don't know to be honest um at the moment uh in current running projects um the eu uh, uh sorry the, the uk was a member state um and under the withdrawal agreement where, where the UK left the EU, it continues to be part of, of the program. So for all the projects that are, that are currently running, and also incidentally for the projects that we will select this summer, the last projects under the current program, um, UK institutions are still in and they still count as program countries. But for the new program, um, I'm, I'm afraid we, we don't know because there, we don't know what the future relation of the UK with the EU will be. And, and, and therefore, we don't know if it will be taking part in um, the new Erasmus program as, as a European country or as a partner country. Um, so I'm afraid I can't answer that. I don't have a crystal ball for that. Um, then on the student um, educational website, um, I I will have to think about that. I'm I'm not I'm not quite sure what the right um, foundation for that would be. Um, our projects tend to focus on. Um, institutional cooperation between between universities um, but um, bear, bear with me on that perhaps perhaps you, you perhaps I can have your email address to, to send a, a reply on that because it may be that there is something in a, in another part of the program that could help with that particular um, idea all right um, so so um, I think that's that's pretty much all the question for uh, for now. Um, yeah, uh, with that, I would like to thank uh, Miss uh, Alan Flanagan and Mr. Adrian Bill for your time and for the very informative uh, session. Um, we will share uh, the the slide and as as well as the recorded session uh, when when it is available to all the participants. Uh, I. I think that will be the same slide and the, all the information uh, with the link will be uh, included in the slide. I think uh, that's all. I, I will hand over the session to Professor Mustafa if he has anything to say. Hi, Andrea and Ellen. Thank you so much for your time. This is quite early morning for you, right? <laughs> no, it's okay. It's, 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 it's 10 o'clock. It's, uh, it's so I, I will actually in Ireland. The... It's, it's earlier. It's nine o'clock. Uh, Ireland at nine. It's still okay. Still <laughs> oh, sociable. So I will provide you all the uh, participants' uh, email and the name for your uh, action if you want to use for to email. But uh, for your for your slide, I will email to them. I think almost registered here around hundred eleven registered here. Maybe some more not registered. So I provide all the information to you, both of you. But my my vice chancellor really are looking forward to to make like arrangement to meet the ambassador, EU ambassador in Malaysia. We will plan soon. All right, Ellen, thank you so much for your time. So meet, hope to meet you again. Terima kasih. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Uh, th thank you. Thank you very much, Mustafa. And, and could you send me? Could you send me the the transcript of the chat as well? I think that would be useful to have. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm afraid I have to go to my next meeting. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. So, untuk participant drop drop you punya email dekat uh, Google Form tu, kita akan email the uh, recording and also uh, ongat the. Uh, Slide presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Shu. Thank you, Prof. All right. Okay. <laughs> drop the drop uh, Google form email. Kat sini saya tak tahu ni. I think uh, we do we have to fill in our Google, uh, email address in the Google form? Yes, better. Uh, I think uh, there is a section that we have to fill in so. Those who registered, uh, 
probably uh, already uh, you already have their email address. So this I put also link for check the PIC number for book for each university. I think almost um, uh, public university they have their own PIC numbers. So I think you can check from th this link I put here. And also one more time for attendance. Thank you, thank you, Pak Subai. Thank you, Pak Subai. Pak, nanti uh, bisa apply itu Erasmus Credit Mobility for the first one. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. Credit Mobility, very interesting. Credit yeah, Mobility uh, within five to seven days. Yeah. For for one more. week, that should be should be give us a new experience, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So maybe not this year, maybe for next year. Next year, inshallah, yeah. <laughs> because this year, yeah. yeah. Make a plan now. Yeah. And for yeah. master's degree as well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for master's degree. Inshallah. Thank you, Pak Pusti. Terima kasih, Pak Bos. Jumpa 21 untuk Geo Polima. Inshallah. Inshallah. Okay, terima kasih semua. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.